Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, and the Kern High School District. With additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California. Well, good afternoon and welcome to Do The Math. I'm Michael. I'm Devin. I'm Judah. For, for math homework help, call in Bakersfield 636-4357. Everywhere else would be 1-888-866-636-6284. The email for Do The Math would be do the math at kern.org. We're also online at do the math online .net. And on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. All right, nicely done. So, Judy, where do you go to school and what grade are you in? So, I am in, I go to Singlum Elementary School and I am in sixth grade. All right, have you been at Lum for a long time? Yes, I've been there since I was in kindergarten. So, you have to leave next year. Yes, and what's one thing you're going to miss about Lum? Everything. And my, and my wonderful teachers, I'm going to miss as well. Well, good. You know what? I'm glad that you said that. I feel like so, we got a graduation speech right here on the show. Yeah. It's amazing. Here's uh, so, so you've been there since kindergarten, right? Yes. Are any of your like a long time like kindergarten, first grade? Are they still there? Um, pr pretty much all of them. I do have my first grade teacher that retired that year. Okay. But, but otherwise, they're all still there. Yeah. Well, good. Well, then you my can let them know when you uh, leave at the end of the year how much you appreciated them. So having spent so much time there, and you obviously say you're going to miss the instructors and everything about love, is there anything you're looking forward to when you go to seventh grade? Well, so one thing that I'm looking forward to is actually the campus because it looks so nice. And I've heard that um, Tevis there has so much like extracurriculars. Okay, so you know where you're going. You're going to Tevis. Yeah. And you guys, I guess you've already been there on a field trip maybe. They yeah. bring you guys to take a look at it. Yeah, we went on an instrumental field trip actually. Oh, good. Okay. So what instrument do you play? I play the bass clarinet. All right. And you've been doing that for a couple of years, I take it, or is this your first year? This is my first year. Last year I played regular clarinet. And why did you switch, or is it something they said, hey? I decided to switch because I just think the bass clarinet's a wonderful instrument. Okay. And do you think you'll stick with that, or do you think you'll probably get into some other instruments also? I'm probably also going to get into the double bass. The double bass is like a cello, but it's a lot bigger and lower pitched. So you're going to be a musician probably when you get a little bit older. Maybe probably. even on the side or something like that, right? Probably. All right, good. Well, sounds good. You ready to do a little math today? Of course I am. All right, let's take a look at today's problem of the day. Here's our social media problem of the day. What is the value of the underlined number? So we have a pretty big number there, and the three all the way to the left is underlined. So you know place value, obviously, being in sixth grade. Yeah. So out of those options, what do you think it is? Well, depend, because of the, all of the sets of three I see, I would guess it's B, three billion. Three billion. So you would guess it's B or do you know it's B? Oh, I know it's B, okay, sorry. Okay, so you know it's B. <laughs> all right. So why do you think the other ones would be there? So three million. So what number is in the millions place right now? The millions place would be the number four. Okay. And what about hundred? Because it says three hundred. And there's obviously a what in the hundreds place. There w there's a one in the right. hundreds place. And three, if it was all by itself, it would be three, right? Yeah. That's so you feel pretty confident. I mean, yeah. it's a pretty easy one, straightforward for you. So you're going to go with B? Yes. All right, let's take a look at it and see if you, indeed you are correct. All right, there you go. Three billion. First problem done. All right. See how easy that was? Yeah. That'd be the easiest one you do of the day, though. Six three six four three five seven is the phone number. We do have phone tutors available most Tuesdays and Wednesdays throughout the regular school year. Time now for today's Math in the News. All right, today's Math in the News. We are fortunate enough to have Harky in studio with us. And Harky, how are you? Good. Nice Thanks to having see you. Me. Yeah. So you are an engineer. Yes. And tell us what type of engineer you are. 
And so, who you work for? So I work for Caltrans. I'm a civil engineer. Uh, I'm a senior design manager there. So I, we keep busy and uh, we help build roadways. All right. And there's a pretty important one that we need to talk about, right? The yes. Centennial Corridor. Yes. And how long has this been from thought of, right, the conception of it, like, all right, this is what we need to do until it opening. It's not even complete everything uh, yet, right? Yeah, it was early in the works. It's not completed fully yet, but it's start, I would say, 2005 is when it's been started. So it's to 20 develop. years, basically. Yes, almost 20 years will be fully. Been the making here. Yes. And how, so what got you into engineering? Was there some course in school that you took early on or something that guided you, some experience that you said, hey, this is kind of what I want to do? Yeah, I, growing up, my uh, uncles were contractors. They built a lot of homes, so I started getting into the design. Uh, into architecture. So growing up, I just had a passion for it and went to school for um, structural engineering, actually, and then pivoted to civil when I moved, went to Cal came to Caltrans. Okay, and then you said you were design also, right? Yes. So, okay, so is that a highly specialized or there's a group of... For Caltrans, there, we have a group in our design unit. So I supervise a group of uh, eight to nine engineers currently, and so we work on different projects in um, we're Central Region Services, which covered District 5, 6, and 10, which is Central Coast, Fresno, Bakersfield area, and District 10 is Stockton area as well. All right. Well, let's take a look at some of the slides that you brought here. So we can see the length of the Centennial Corridor, the full length of it right there. Yes. Um, but what we want to do is get into the particulars here. So obviously there's a big cost with this, mm -hmm. especially over the number of years, so over $600 million. So talk about Thomas, Bill Thomas, and how this whole thing kind of, because he's the one that kind of said, hey, this is what we need, and let's start planning this. Yeah, so early in the stages, uh, pre-2005, Bill Thomas, or Congressman Bill Thomas was in Washington, D.C. He was able to pull funds um, for the TRIP, or Thomas Rose Improvement Program, and that was how we were able to start this Highway 58. And the biggest thing Highway is 58. connecting the two ends of Bakersfield, west and correct. east, correct? Is that Correct, That's, this ties Bakersfield together. Um, there was a disconnect because Highway 58 ended at 99, and you would have to take Rosedale if you wanted to go to... Right, and it would take a while to get from yeah. there to Rosedale. Correct. Okay. And so, are you from here? Like, you've been here for a long time? I've been here in the area. I'm actually... We're based... Uh, my office is based out of Fresno. Okay. Um, but I'm familiar with Bakersfield. I have family that live here as well. Okay. My sister lives here. Well, so I, I, I haven't moved out here. I'm not... I'm wondering if, like, you know, 58 was always like that. So, Johnny, you've been here for a while, right? Always been like that since so it's always been yes. like that. Okay, so 58 ended, bam, it was right at the was, end there. Yeah. And, uh, so you guys needed to fix this. Correct. Okay. So, yep, this ties Highway 58 all the way to I-5 now. So tell us what we're looking at. So it says conceptual so we're doing alternate routes, right? Yes, correct. So during these this stages, this is the early stages of the design. Um, we have to go through all of our clearances, environmental clearances. We have to meet with the community for engagement. So it's a big... Uh, tasks. Now, and talking about the community and the engagement, I'm sure there were a lot of people that said, don't put that road in my backyard. Yes. Okay. Yes. So that's, that so was a lot of... So how many headaches was that? That's one of the big ones, especially okay. in the early phases, to make sure you have the right design. Um, that's the most feasible design and efficient. So right here, we're showing, uh, I believe, five alternatives, A through E. Um, and right now, we alternate B in the purple is what ended up being final. Okay. And as far as the environmental thing also, because you need to take a look at the animal life there. Correct. Plant life. Correct. All sorts of things like We that. also go over the river, um, Kern River here. So there was a lot that goes into it. So the Environmental Engineering Division um, Functional Unit, they had to go through a lot of back and forths and um, coordination on their end to make this possible. All right, let's take a look at the next one here. Uh, so these are some of the things you had to deal with as far as design speed, lane width, shoulder width, all of these different areas. Yes, yes. So the, what you see on the screen is, is our general uh, design criteria that we look at. Um, these are all items that, because we have to have the route fit in the allowed space that we have and we acquired um, through the alternatives that we showed prior, that's, these are all the items that we look at to make sure it fits and, and, and all the design of those works. Alternate safely. routes you had, mm -hmm. those were going to be feasible based on the sizes of everything you needed, right? Yes. So those alternatives we would actually acquire land after the alternatives are developed. Okay. Yeah, because you have to make sure we have the right route before we start acquiring property. So acquiring property just means having more money to... Yes. Okay. 
costs more and costs increase. Right. So here's where I know a lot of students are going to get pretty hyped up on this one because especially if they're looking towards engineering a little bit. Mm -hmm. And now they can start seeing, all right, here's where the math part of it comes in, where I can see what's being done. Yes. So talk a little bit about what we've got here. So I included a cross-section of our plants that we developed and designed. Um, so what you see here, it's State Route 58, or this one is a freeway. It's a six-lane divided freeway with a median barrier. So you can see at the very center the median, uh, the barrier, concrete barrier itself, and then the, the slope of the lanes. We have a 36-foot showing. Okay. Um, and that's for three lanes because it's a six lane highway. So 12 foot lanes are standard. Three times 12 is 36. So that's what we're showing 36 foot lanes in the middle there. Okay. Uh, 10 foot shoulders are standard as well for a six lane freeway. All right. And then out on the side here, right? Because here's your shoulder. Correct. Right. And this is just whatever happens to be out there? Yes. So that's where our, uh, what is called right away, which is our property line, is what what the RW in the screen okay. shows. So that's our property line. We want to make sure that the slope gradually uh, either increases or decreases. In this case, you can see that our roadway is higher than the actual ground elevation. Right, because you want flowing off. Yeah, exactly, right. exactly. So are there instances where they will make lanes wider than 12? Or is it always 12 and that's what it's going to be? Typically 12. We don't try not to go wider than 12. Uh, that's standard, um, and we don't deviate from that to, in, in normal processes. So the shoulders, they do change based on the amount of lanes we have on a freeway. Okay. Uh, so it could So decrease. let's say you didn't have six, you had four. Then so it, would you it need would a 10 be foot shoulder, or what would you need? 10 foot outside shoulders, I believe it's eight foot uh, inside shoulders. So that's the one near the center line. Okay. So it could decrease as the lanes. And the size of the median has to always be, or is that once again dependent on the lanes? No, the median is standard. Okay. So we have our traffic, traffic safety division. They can always chime in. But typically, we have a standard. Uh, and when I say standard, it's just uh, Caltrans has developed um, like normalized uh, heights of concrete barrier medians or widths. And so we have. Now, when I moved out here from New York, when I'm traveling down the highways, they've got these plants in the medians. Yes. Uh, what are those? I'm trying to think. I, I've got the name I on the tip of my tongue. I don't know the name of it. Crate Myrtle. Crate Myrtle? Okay. Somebody was telling me that that's actually a poisonous plant. That I don't know. It 100%. is, right? So if you got in a crash so and the cake <laughs> came into your window, right? Yeah. Like, we'll, we'll hope that doesn't happen. All right. Yeah. I was going to say, I, you know, I didn't know if there, you guys were like, all right, it's 13 feet and we're going to put gonna these put plants in here and stuff like that. All right. So let's talk about the next one as far as the curves yes. on these. Yeah, so super elevation I included here. A super elevation is the slope uh, of the lane when you're on a turn. So a horizontal curve is what it's called as well. So we, you see in the picture here, that's the flyover, but it's also showing a curve. Right. Um, and so a super elevation, you can't, if you're going you know, straight on a freeway, you're going to need a slight slant on the road so your car doesn't overrun the road on your speeds. So well, I was going to say, and then with high you know, like trucks and things exactly. like that, and windy it'll, conditions, it'll you pull make more. Sure that this thing's not going to... Yeah. So we have a max of typically 12 on our standards. Uh, we don't usually go that high, 12%. Okay. Uh, the steeper you get, the harder it is. To also, if you're in a congested area and you actually have to stop, you know, in traffic or anything, you're going you to be, like you're gonna be right. falling over. Yeah. I feel like falling over. All right. So the pavement type, because this is something that you don't want to have to constantly be fixing. Yes, correct. So pavement type, we had a 40-year design life. That's our standard as well. JPCP, or it's jointed plane concrete pavement and continuously reinforced concrete pavement. So those are concrete pavements are typically the durable. They last longer, reduce maintenance, less cost overall. And what's the minimum amount of time you need for that to once it's set before you start testing it out and driving on it? Uh, they, they have standards of the duration that you could drive on it. I think it is pretty quick, but to fully cure, I know it's over 28 days technically. Okay. Uh, concrete is. And talk a little bit about the driver's sight. Sight distance, yes, yeah, sight distance is an important one. I try to include like an easy description, but right. that's a major item because you want to make sure. So if there's a horizontal curve or a turn and there's a tree in the way of the turn, you can't see. So it's your, it's your visual of how far you can see out on the road ahead of you. So. And the vertical clearance we've got there in the middle because you've obviously got Yes. Trucks and trailers. Trucks, and trailers. We want to make sure it accommodates the height. So we have 16 feet, 6 inches. That's our standard height. 
for any new bridge or upgrades, we try to keep, it, uh, keep up with that height requirements. All right. And the Mohawk off-ramp, so this is something that they just had where you could bike on this thing. Yes, they had a bike day after our ribbon cutting yeah. uh, in early February. Um, so now it's officially open. Right. Um, and so what you're looking at here is just crossing over the river, uh, the Kern River, I believe. On this picture, um, also looking eastbound on State Route 58 is the tie-in from California to 99. And so that last picture on the right is um, the 99 interchange. Okay. And so the two missing uh, connections that we have that are still in the planning stages are um, eastbound 58 to northbound 99. So if you're going on the right picture, if you're going right on 58, it okay. ties up north. And then also the southbound 99 to westbound 58. So coming down from 99 and it'll be a flyover. Well, I know there was a lot of excitement when these things started opening and, you know, gradually other parts open and things like that. Yeah. And I'm sure when the, the rest of it is finally complete. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, as you said, hopefully the pavement stays intact without needing yes. repair because there's a lot of other roads that need repair. Yes. And it seems as though constantly, I don't think, so answer me this, mm -hmm. will there ever be a day when California highways will not have somebody working on them. Oh no. Okay, I was going to say we're, I don't we're think California. Ever, we have the ever most. Happen, right? We have because the most routes. So large. Yeah, right? we have one of the biggest states. We have the most routes on our state. So, do you have any idea what's going on down by Magic Mountain? Uh, I don't know that one. Right. That, well, you're that off one, yeah, that, that one, one right leads there. our district. Say, that thing's constantly a uh, mess uh, upgrade. Down there. Okay, got gotcha. you. No, <laughs> no, don't know what's going on in that area. All right. Well, Harky, we certainly do appreciate Thank you, so you coming much, in to yeah. uh, share a little bit appreciate of time with us. Me. That was today's Math in the News. 636-4357 is the phone number. We do have phone tutors available most Tuesdays and Wednesdays throughout the regular school year. In studio, we have Jude, a sixth grade student from Lum Elementary. And uh, you brought in a little bit of homework, so we're going to go ahead and work on the first one. All right, so let's take a look at it together. Mick loves candy bars. Well, who doesn't? Do you like candy bars? Sure. What kind do you like the best? Or if somebody said, hey, you can have any candy bar, what do you like? Well, I honestly love Snickers. That seems like a favorite of a lot of kids, the Snickers right there. Help us All right, it. good. All right. So he has 27 bars left after Halloween. So you guys can write down any information you think you're going to need. So he has 27 Snickers bars left. He only ate two-thirds of a bar at a time. So he doesn't eat a whole bar. He eats two-thirds of a bar at a time. Very precise. Are we talking about those fun size? Are we talking full size? We're going to go full size. What a haul for Halloween. You get full size bars? Like, that's a neighborhood. I want to make sure I'm walking around. Well, this that's could be from years ago also. So. Yeah, yeah. Good day. We got the ding on that one. All right, so he soon discovered that he could put three leftover pieces together to make a new bar. With 27 bars on hand, how many bars can he eat before they're all gone? All right. So we've got a, good, a lot of good information here to reference. We've got the problem we can always check back on. What do we need to find in order to be successful with this problem? So what we need to find would be the, um... oh shoot. <laughs> let's check, let's bring that back up on camera, see, just as a reference here. How many bars can we eat before they're all gone? So essentially, we want to make sure that if we're eating two thirds of a bar at a time, how many of those can we do before we have nothing left? So maybe with a model, we can kind of start to visualize what this approach would look like. So if we have a full bar, and we break this up into thirds, scale notwithstanding, we know that Mick is going to eat this part, and then what happens to this part here? This part, this part would be uh, leftovers. Right, so that would be one third, right? So yeah. we're eating two thirds here, and then we're putting a third off to the side. Now, according to the original problem, if we eat three, if we put three of these together, that's about the same pieces to make a new bar, right? And so let's talk a little bit about this process, okay? Okay. We eat one of these. We put this piece to the side. Let's do that again. Another bar. We eat this, and we bring that off to the side. Now, could we eat this? This could be a two-thirds of a bar. Could we eat one of these here then? Yeah. Because that would be two-thirds of a bar. So essentially what we've got to figure out is how many of these two-thirds pieces 
inclusive of these one thirds, are we going to be able to get out of the 27 candy bars? So how might we figure that out big picture? Because, you know, working this out with just these first two, we get to three, right? Yeah. So now how are we going to do that with 27? All right. So maybe, maybe just to be a little bit more simple, maybe we can multiply or divide 27 by, um, maybe divide 27 by two thirds. That's really interesting. So we're looking to treat this as a broader division situation here. Now, if we want to divide this, what would be your approach? So first, I would, so first I would, this is the way my math teacher teaches me. All right. If we need more room, we can go ahead and make a right. little bit more room here. We're focusing mainly just on 27 divided by 2 thirds here. All right, so first what you have to do is you have to turn this, you have to turn 27 into a fraction. This would be 27 over 1. And then we have to change the division sign to a multiplication sign. So you're treating the division of 2 thirds as multiplying by the inverse of that, knowing yeah. what you know about the relationship between multiplication and division. So. And then we flip it, 3 over 2. Right. So 27 times 3 would be 9 would be 91. Well, let's check that, make sure oh, there, right? We have 2 oh, times eight. 3 is, yeah. Okay, that go. would be 81. Right. So we're so talking that would 81 be over 2. Right. So we would divide 2 by 81, and since we already know it's not going to go into it evenly. So now 2 times eight, 4 would equal 8. We're essentially looking to see how many groups of two we can get out of 81. So here's a little something before you guys keep going on that because you're going to get into something that's not going to help you in the long run. Oh. Okay. So think about it this way. Let's just logic our ways through this. All right. You have 27 bars. If you have a third of a bar left from each of those bars, how many little thirds can you put together to make how total bars? So if we had three thirds, that's going to make how many bars? That three thirds makes one bar. It's going to make one bar, right? How many thirds do you have left over after you chow down open, and you, you opened all 27? You ate two thirds and you threw a third by way every time. So you have how many thirds sitting there? So what we would do is probably, I would guess we would do this by 27 divided by three. Right. And then we would have seven thirds left over. How many? 27 divided by 3? We would have 7 thirds left over. What's 27 divided by 3? Oh, 7. Try it again, son. 27. <laughs> let's count up. Let's start 27 with 27 divided by... So let, yeah, let's count up by 3s oh. until we get to 27, right? Look at it this way. So Because I know you know it, but you're probably... I was thinking of 21 fast. divided by... Ah, okay. So what would 27 so. divided by 3 then? If we know 21 divided by 3 is 7... What is 27 divided by 3? So... We're thinking about 3 times what is 27. Oh, gosh. Um, that would be 9. There nine. you go. All right. So we started with 27 bars. Out of the little pieces you left over, you now have 9. Yes. Now, he's going to take those 9 bars. Imagine they all fused together and wrapped up. He's going to open up those 9 bars. And what's he going to do with each one of them? He's going to make them into full bars. Well, he's, he's got a full he bar, a full right? Bar, he's got he nine do? full bars. He's going to eat, he's gonna eat two thirds of, of each. Right. right. So think, how many thirds is he going to have off to the side again? He will have another three th thirds, which would equal one. Well, he'll have nine thirds out there, right? Yeah. And if you have nine thirds, how many new bars can you now make? Well, you can make, you could actually, oh, <laughs> um, so nine thirds would actually make another would make another three good bars. Right. So so you, so you started with twenty seven bars, and now you have nine bars. So altogether you've done thirty six bars. Now you have three bars. What are you going to do with those three bars? He's there. You take two thirds away from them. So go through that process again. 
And how many little thirds are you going to have left over? We're going to have one whole bar, which is three thirds. Right. And will you have anything left over now? Well, yeah. Because you're going to eat two thirds, and okay. then. But then you only have the one third left. Yes. So if you had twenty-seven, and then you had nine, and then you had three, and then you had one, the question is, how many candy bars would you have had before the full candy bars are gone? So just think about twenty-seven, nine, three, and one. So we had twenty-seven. We were able to make nine bars out of those 27. We were able to make three bars out of that nine, and we were able to make one bar out of that three. So each of these is considered a whole bar. We probably need to add all these up together, correct? Yes. So what would be a quick way to add these up? So we could group, we could group each. Yeah, I see what we're doing here. And then add, which we would get 16, and then group these, and then get Four. Well, how do we get to 16 from 20? Oh, you're talking about the ones place here. I yeah, see. Okay, so that gives us with 20. I see. Okay. And then we would add 3 plus 1 equals 4. So if we add that, we would get... Let's move some of this out of the way, too, to give you some more okay. space, if that's all right. Okay. There we go. So if we add that, we would get end up with 20. But we have to put the 2, oh, 2, up here, end up, up with 4. So 40. So overall, we would have had started with or eventually created 40 different candy bars. Right. You yes. had the third left over, but he doesn't eat a third. He always Who doesn't eats eat a third? Two thirds. Oh, well, right. I mean, there's flexibility so, in there any you situation. Go. So 40 candy bars there? he would have had. Yeah. So nice work on that. For your great work on the uh, <laughs> two thirds of a candy bar at a time, you've got yourself a meal courtesy of our friends at Chick fil A. So congratulations on that. 636-4357 is that phone number. We'll be back with more right after this. Today we're at Jurassic Vineyards, and I'll meet with my friend Jim as he tells me about the ins and outs of the wine industry here in Tehachapi. Good morning. Welcome to Triassic. I'm Jim Arnold. Hi, nice to meet you. Likewise. So Jim, I'm excited to be here at Triassic Vineyards. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell me some stuff about the vineyard and the creation of it? Certainly. Um, the vineyard was originally planted by Chuck McCullough, who was uh, in 2008, and he's a geologist. And uh, he retired from Shell Oil about, after about 30 years, and he retired out in Stallion Springs. And they got interested in vineyards and started reading these books on vineyards. And there's a chapter on soils. The things it talked about was a vineyard in France that was planted on Triassic soil and the wonderful grapes for wine that was grown on the Triassic soil. So Chuck being a geologist, as he was driving by the 202 all the time, he happened to notice that these two hills uh, were barren. And, um, and all the uh, soil eroded down to here and there's uh, rocks in the, in the crevices, and uh, those are all characteristics of the Triassic period. Well, I would love for you to show me around. Well, certainly. If you don't mind jumping in my John Deere, we can uh, go down here a little ways. It's such a beautiful vineyard. I'm excited to look around. Well, I'm happy to share it with you. Okay. We wake up to the sunshine and the wide open spaces, <laughs> and um, so we enjoy it. Jim, so tell me about the vines that you grow, how many you guys have, and how much you guys produce. Well, we have uh, about 7,200 vines, and that produces uh, right around 20 to 21 tons. But our winemaker, to get the quality wines, we control the amount of grapes we grow because it's about quality, not quantity. Yeah. Uh, ends up being somewhere around uh, 1,400 cases or roughly 17,000 bottles. Wow, that's a lot of wine to drink. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> and how many acres do you guys own? 
Well, we have 15 acres, but we have seven acres of vines. Oh, okay. So we have room to plant a couple more acres, which we hope to do in the near future. And I'm sure with all your bottles, you guys will get there. So tell me something about the grapes and the different types we are walking through right now. Well, the, this grapes right here are um, grapes that we grafted. This used to be an, uh, an acre of Vignet vines. And if you'll notice, this thick vine is 12 years old. But what we did a couple of years ago is we sliced into it. Well, we did pruning and we sliced into it. We put a bud there and uh, it took about, about a year and a half to grow. And so we converted a Vignet vine into a Cabernet grape. I've never eaten a grape right off the vine before. Well, you'll be surprised. Yeah, I mean, it has a little bit of like a sweet It has a little sweet, but it. see, it, it, it's not ripe yet. Mm -hmm. um, but it's getting there. But it's interesting to taste them as we, as they go through um, uh, ripening, uh, how they get um, sweeter and sweeter. Mm -hmm. And um, that's when we have to worry about birds, because the birds <laughs> like them too. <laughs> A barrel of wine will carry about 55 gallons and will make an estimated 300 bottles. And now with the growth, how has that e economically impacted to Hatchby and just the county itself? Well, that's a good question. People come here for wine tasting. They typically will stop and have a lunch or dinner. Mm -hmm. um, they'll fill up with gas. They might go shopping for antiques. Oftentimes when they've never been here before, they'll stay overnight because they haven't seen enough. Yeah. And it's a pleasant surprise. So it definitely adds revenue to uh, the community, but also more importantly, as the Kern County finds out about us, then it's keeping money in Kern County and it's not going to Paso Robles mm -hmm. or Napa, Santa Barbara, the coast, other places. And uh, that's our goal, is really to keep money in Kern County and bring more revenue to Kern County as a result of the industry. That's why I'm really happy about this video, that uh, it'll give up more opportunity for people to learn about us up here. because. Um, I think we've got a great opportunity uh, and it helps for hiring employers, employers hiring people, believe it or not. Yeah. Uh, one guy told me that he was trying to recruit a guy from the East Coast and um, there's a lot of challenges in recruiting him, but when they found out they had wineries, he says was it was a quality of life thing. I wasn't on the top of the list, but it just helped to uh, improve the quality of life here to attract people from out of the area. So you also mentioned that you guys are receiving um, a lot of people from LA and surrounding areas. How many of those visitors are from out of town? We are definitely, the majority of our, of our guests are coming from out of the area. All right, a little bit more about one of the businesses right up the hill in Tehachapi right there. We do have phone tutors available on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. We've got Jude, a sixth grade student from LUM, working in studio with us right now. But we're going to go to the phones for a phone call from Andrew. How are you today? Good. All right, as soon as you're ready, go ahead and read the problem that you're working on. If a bunch of positive integers adds up to 20, what is the greatest possible product of these numbers? Oh, all right. So we have two problems here. So we're going to work on the bottom one also. But so we've got it on the screen. So some of the uh, people that were so if a bunch of positive integers adds up to 20, what is the greatest possible product of these numbers? Because so you have to have numbers that add up to 20. It doesn't you're say look, that it doesn't tell you number. how many you need. Right. It could be two. It could be more. Right. So, Andrew, talk to Devin about how you would like to start this problem. Uh, I'm not actually sure how I should start it, actually. Maybe... I'm, I'm, I'm completely, like, I don't know. 
Well, we, here's the nice thing about problems. If we don't know where to start, if we don't know what it can be, that means it could be anything, which means we could try anything. So right. let's try something. Let's come up with some numbers that add up to 20 and then multiply them. And that's going to give us a starting point so we can see if we can go further. So what numbers could we add together to get to 20? More than the same, uh, more than one of the same numbers. Could they be more than? You know what? I think they can, right? Because if if we so I, if we use the same number multiple times and it adds up to twenty, we could do that. So what would you like to try? Uh, maybe four or five, possibly. All right. Now remember, we want to add these up to get to twenty, right? So four and five will get us. Twenty. To not remember, we're adding. I think he's using. Did you say use four fives? Yeah. Oh, okay, four so he's going to go five plus five. So plus that's five. great. Okay, let's do that. So we have five and five and five and five. All right. Yeah, we add those up. That's going to get us to twenty. If we yeah. multiply all of this together, and you know, we might notate that as five to the fourth power. But if we yeah. multiply five times five times five times five. You'll get six and a quarter. So, six hundred twenty-five. Yeah. That's a great start. That's a pretty big product here for multiplying five times five times five times five. Good start. Let's see if we can try something different, and see if it gets us something larger or smaller. So here's something I would suggest because he went with four fives. Let's right. try five fours. Ooh, okay. That's another way around that. And let's see what happens. So we're taking the same value, but to a higher exponent. This is actually 4 to the fifth power. So yeah. let's figure out 4 to the fifth here. And I'm going to help yeah. you out because the use of a calculator is going to be helpful here. Oh, tremendous. So this is going to be 1,024. Interesting. So that gives us a larger product. This is our leader in the clubhouse. We've got 1,024 as our largest product. What else could we try just to see if it gets us greater than 1,024? And you're about 400 away from what it actually will total up to be. What about... Is, uh, 10 twos maybe? I'm not oh, so now we're going to go 2 to the 10th power. So you're saying 2... Plus two, plus two, so two ten times. Yeah. All right, so two to the tenth power. If we add all those twos together, it'll get us to 20. So think about it. Two times two is what? Uh, four. Okay, times two. Uh, eight. Keep going with Devin. Uh, eight. Sixteen. Yeah. Thirty-two. Thirty-two. Uh, uh, 64. 64. 128. Keep it going. We got seven down. Uh, wait. Uh, so 128 times two? 256. 256. Yeah, and then 512. 512, and then one more. 1,024. We're right back where we started. Right. All that work, so and the we reason still I wanted you to do that is think about this for a second, Andrew. You used five fours. If you cut oh. four in half, you're going to get oh, twos, yeah. right? So now you're yeah. going to have ten twos, which is the same thing. Yeah. Do you see why that happens? So I'm going to give you a little hint. You've tried fours, you've tried twos. Try threes. Because uh. threes, you're going to be able to use how many of those? You're going to be able to use six. Okay, so do six threes, and then you're going to need something else. Um, maybe a two? Yeah. Right, so because the ones the won't help you. So we're going to essentially add, um, we have three to the sixth, and then we're also going to multiply that by two. Yeah. So. So three to the third is 27. So I want you to go 27 times 27. Okay, so 27 times 27. That would be, uh, and you lost your board there, Devin. Oh, 
Well, let's come back here. Luckily, we're just with 27 times 27. Right. Right. 729. Now let's multiply that by 2 since we still have that 2 that we need to bring in as well. But I get the sense multiplying this by set by uh, by 2 here is going to get us greater than 1024. Yeah. 1458. 1458. And I'm just going to let you know that you are going to be able to try a bunch of different combinations to get numbers to add up to 20. But when you multiply them, you will not be able to get any higher than 1,458. But I do appreciate you calling in, taking the uh, shot with the four fives, the five fours, the ten twos, things like that. So you just got to start somewhere and then go with it like that. All right. So for your phone call in today, Andrew, you've got yourself a meal courtesy of our friends at Grillenberger. So congratulations on that. Thanks. Did you work on that also while he was doing that? What numbers did you come up with? I actually just sort of... Listened to him and went along with him? Yeah. There you go. Nothing wrong with that, right? Tell me more, Andrew. Yeah, Get there you go. There. All right. right. Nicely done. Uh -huh. Hey, you know what? Right now we're going to talk a little math. The quadratic formula. Hello. My name is Joel from Valley Oaks Charter School. And today I'm going to show you how to solve the quadratic formula. This right here is the quadratic formula. y equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. These are the numbers we're going to be using today. a equals 1, b equals negative 5, and c equals 4. This equation with the numbers plugged in is going to look like y equals, because it's negative, b and b is negative, it's going to be 5 plus or minus the square root of 5, negative 5, sorry, squared minus 4, 1, 4. And this is all over 2. Well, times 1. This is then going to turn into y equals 5 plus or minus <coughs> 4 times 4 is going to be negative 16. 5 squared is going to turn into 25. It's going to be positive 25 because anything, a negative squared is going to be positive. So it's going to be 25 minus 16, and this is all over 2. This is then going to go into y equals 5 plus or minus square root of 9 over 2, which the square root of 9 <coughs> is going to be 3. So it's going to be y equals plus or minus 5 plus or minus 3 over 2. Our answers are going to be y equals 8 over 2, and y equals 2 over 2, which then, because it's going to be, we're finding the zeros when solving quadratic, it's actually going to be x equals 4, and x equals 1. These are our answers. Thank you, and this is an example of finding zeros using quadratic formula. All right, nice to see Joel right there. As a matter of fact, Joel is now uh, one of the people behind the scenes that do the math, helping to work out uh, all of the sound to make sure you can hear all of us. And uh, oh, he's running camera today. All right, well, he, because he usually does sound, correct? Because I'm listening to the guys in the back, but okay. So he's, he's, he's talented in many different things there behind the scenes. All right, there we go. Jude, a sixth grade student from Lamas in Studio with us today, working on some great problems. So we have one more for you boys to work on. Let's go ahead and take a look at it together. So we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 
We're going to put those numbers so that the sum of any two consecutive is not a prime number. And well, it says one is not a prime number. So if we just look at them the way they are right now, <clears throat> if we have zero plus one, that makes one, one doesn't count, it's not a prime number. Right, one's considered neither prime nor composite. So right, and if we go like this, that. if we did four plus five, that's nine, nine is not prime. So this is not going to work like this. Even though we could go one and two is three, that works, two and three is five, good, three and four is seven, but we get mixed up there. So that order is not going to work, all right? So what you guys need to do is you need to put those numbers in order so that any two consecutive added is not prime. So over to the board, boys. Good news is we don't have to pick up a stylus for this because we can just interact with these and move them as necessary. Now, we saw that the two reasons why this sequence won't work is because one is not considered a prime number, so we can't do zero plus one. And nine is a composite number because we can divide it by three, so we can't have four and five next to each other. With that information, how would you like to start arranging these? So, so the way I would arrange this first is probably, probably um, arrange seven first because I actually forgot what a consecutive number was. All right, so consecutive just means one next to the other. Oh. So if we have all of these values, you want to go ahead and put seven in the beginning. That's great, but we still have zero and one, and we still have four and five. All right, so. Let's, oh. oh, let's go ahead. Yep, they're all individualized, so go ahead. So let's move four over here. All right. And then, oh, no, 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 no. Okay, because no. you see in four plus two would be six, so let's bring this four back together there. All right, yeah, so four plus two together, that brings us to six. Yeah. There's a couple of other th situations here that are playing out. I see three and five, which gets us to eight. Any even number can't be prime except for two because we'd be able to divide it by two. But sometimes that helps get us closer because we keep moving things around. So what else could we move and, and help us get a little closer? Well, maybe we should move, oh. Yep, let's bring that together here, four. All right, so we're gonna bring the three back where the four was. So we're swapping out the three and the four. Now, we have a similar situation. Now we, instead of, one plus five, we have one plus three, which is four. Again, not quite prime. We also have four and five, we have two and four. It's almost like we made more composite numbers by, by moving that around, but that's still helpful to get us closer to where we need to be. All right, so next, next try, let's try uh, moving the six over here. Okay, so we're gonna switch the six and the zero. Now, moving these around helps get us a little bit closer. Um, one thing that does stand out that I'm noticing is we're getting some good arrangements here. We have seven and six, which is 13, prime. Six and one, which is seven, that's prime. But as we move further to the right, yeah. all right, so let's try something else here. So let's move these around. And then we would get two plus three, which would equal five. One mm -hmm. plus four, which would equal five. 5 plus 0, which would equal 5, which those are all prime numbers. We still have 6 and 2 next to each other, oh, which gets us to 8. Right. So I'm recognizing something here, and you probably noticed the same thing. That makes this a little challenging. If I have two even numbers next to each other, that won't work because it'll be divisible by 2. Exactly. That's composite. If I have two odd numbers next to each other, let's move. That won't work out. Yeah. 2. Let's move these. Now, is zero considered an even number? Technically, it could be because it is two b before two. And we, we consider even numbers, any number that you can divide by two, right? Yeah. All right, well, what's zero divided by two? Zero. There we go, well, we've done it. In fact, when we add six and zero, six. it's still six. six. Yeah. So try this. <clears throat> Slide the six out of there. Get out Just put six. it at the bottom. Move the seven over a spot. Put the zero in front of the seven. Those two must stay. Okay. So we're gonna lock these in. They're not going anywhere. So I'm just gonna go ahead and lock that down. Not going anywhere. In place. And All we right. still have this six out of the way. Let's see how that impacts 
where we position all these numbers. Remember, if we have two odds next to each other, it's going to give us an even. Divisible by two can't be prime. So let's try to move this. Oh, wait. Let's just try swapping the one and the three. OK, which gives us eight, seven plus one, okay. divisible by two. We okay. want to try to avoid as much as possible. Right, so from this point, I would suggest just taking seven and adding things to it that you know will make that prime right now. Okay. So if we can't add one, that gets us eight. We can't add three, that gets us ten. So what numbers could we add to seven that give us a prime number? That would, you could add four. You could add four. You know what, let me just write a fresh new four. I don't like the way that this is getting yeah. too separate for us. So let's do, uh, I, I saw the way that you had drawn that. Let's do like that, okay? That is one solid piece. All right, so we have four, because we know seven plus four is 11. What else can we add to seven to give us a prime number of the remaining values? Now I'm going to let you know that four stays. Okay, well then, we don't need to bring six in, because that would get us 13 as well. Now, the same conversation applies. Four plus what would give us a prime number? So four plus, plus one would give us a prime, prime number. That gets us five. And okay. your last clue is one is going to be at the end. Ah, oh, oh. let's bring that out there. All right, well, that's still good information because we can look at these others. Which of these add to four to get a prime number? We would get, so four plus three would equal seven, which Great. is a prime number. And I think that might be our only option here of what remains. All right, well, we have three. What of these remaining values... Can we add to three? To and get I know you guys are going to finish this up quickly, so I'm going to let you finish that, and we'll be back to check it out right after this. Hi, I'm John, and today we're in the Do the Math Hot Rod Garage talking about the tools of mathematics. Everything in our dragster is designed to go straight down the quarter mile. Remember, a drag race is an acceleration contest between two vehicles down a straight course a quarter of a mile long. They leave from a standing start. First one to the finish line wins, the loser goes home. That's in eliminations. It's important that each car stay in its own lane. You're disqualified if you cross the center line or touch the wall. That's why everything in our dragster is designed for that car to go straight down the quarter mile. A big part of that are the rear tires on the car. Let's go have a look at those. We race with a specially designed tire called a drag racing slick. It's designed specifically for drag racing. It's a purpose-built tire. It's very wide and very tall on our car. It has no tread on top because we want the maximum contact batch with the racing surface. We want the maximum contact area. It's also made of a very soft rubber. We want the tires to be matched on both sides so that our car can go straight down the track. They need to have the same circumference. That's very important to the car going straight down the track. Let's go back to the workbench and I'll show you what I mean. I've created a model to show you an example of what I mean. This model represents our dragster's tire and wheel combination and the axle in between. We've got the same size wheel on both sides of our axle. If our calculations are correct, this should roll relatively straight down our benchtop racetrack. We've matched our wheels and tires from side to side. Drag racers refer to the circumference as rollout. Rollout is simply a term that means how far will the tire roll in one revolution. Here's a wheel and tire combination that's obviously mismatched from one side to the other. What do you think's going to happen? Wow, it's curving pretty strongly. Here's the reason why. Each revolution of the smaller wheel and tire is a shorter distance, a shorter rollout, than our larger wheel and tire. The axle has no choice but to curve to the side of the smaller tire. Racers refer to the difference in wheels from one side to the other as stagger. We stagger the tires from one side to the other to give the car that ability to turn left or turn right. On a drag strip, we don't want that, but on a circle track, it can be very beneficial. Sprint cars will almost always have a larger tire on the right rear than the left because they turn left all the time on their racetrack, so it works to their advantage. 
That brings us to the tool of mathematics we're going to use today. We could take a regular tape measure and try and measure our tires, but we've got a special tool for that. Let's go back and I'll show you what I mean. Our challenge now is to measure the circumference of our tires to make sure that they're matched. If we use a conventional tape measure, well, I don't think that's going to work too well. Let me show you why. A conventional tape measure is a steel blade that's about an inch wide. It's got a slight curve to it. That helps a carpenter who might be using this to reach out to a 2x4 or a board that's a long ways away. But when we try and wrap it around our tire, it's not going to work very well. Watch. It's showing us over 108 inches, but it's not very accurate. There's a lot of gaps in between the tire surface and our tape measure. That's not going to work for us. But luckily, we have a special tool that's going to help us. It's called a tire stagger tape, and that's today's tool of mathematics. Let me show you how it's used. It's a very thin tape and very flexible. It wouldn't work very well for a carpenter reaching out for a 2x4, but it's going to work great for measuring this tire. We simply go at the center of the tire, wrap the tape measure around, come back up, and check our reading. About 104 and 3 eighths. Let's go over to the other side and make sure it's the same size. hundred and four and a quarter. There's a little bit of difference side to side. I have a suspicion that I know what that might be. Our tires didn't measure exactly the same circumference, but I've got a suspicion. One might have more air pressure than the other. Let me take the tire pressure gauge and have a quick look. This one measures 13 pounds of air. Let's go check the other side. This one only measures 10 and a half pounds of air. Almost three pounds of difference could be the difference in our circumference. I'll let the air out of that side and we'll double check it. Almost there. There we go. 10 and a half pounds, perfect. Now let's check that measurement one more time. Now that we've got the tire pressures matched, let's check that circumference one more time. Right on the money, 104 and a quarter. Now our tires are matched and we're ready to go straight down the drag strip. Thanks to our tool of mathematics, the tire stagger tape. There we go, our resident hot rod expert, John, right there in the stagger tape. Our resident in studio expert, Judah, sixth grader from Lum. So what did you guys figure out here? We got from- So we had the 0743. We, we had these digits remaining, two, five, and six. We figured the two would come in with three to make five. Five next to two gives us seven. Six next to five gives us 11, and then round it out with six and one to get us to seven. So the string holds. There you go, nicely done. So I know there's some other students who will be working on a problem like that, so hopefully they're watching and uh, can see that problem worked out between Devin and Judah right there. So Judah, did you learn a little something today? Yes, I learned a strategy for doing this exact, for this exact problem. This Good. one problem he's Nicely got the strategy done. for. So, did you have fun today? Yes, I had a lot of fun today. Good. Actually. Well, I'm glad you were part of the show today. And until we meet again, continue to do the math. Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, and the Kern High School District. With additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California.